Well, I want to welcome John to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's, it's my honor to be on here. You, you guys are doing some amazing things and any, anything I could do uh, to help out anyone is, is a great thing. And uh, thank you. And you're doing amazing things too. And we are going to get into all about the amazing work that you're doing at the JCK Foundation. Uh, <laughs> but I first want to go into what it's like growing up with OCD. Um, mm -hmm. I get a lot of requests from, not really even from parents, but I get a lot of requests from kids saying, um, there's nobody out there like me. And I think parents also can learn from hearing firsthand what it's like to grow up with OCD, what parents should do. So let's jump into your story if you're okay with that. 100%. And something you even said right there is I remember just thinking there was no one else in the world like me that was having these thoughts. They just felt so intrusive and so overwhelming. And it all started pretty kind of innocently, if you will. Uh, I, I remember this, I didn't even think of this as my OCD, but when I was fourth, fourth grade, third grade, I remember I was obsessed with just finding license plates. Like I had the whole sheet down and I had to find all 50 states and I thought about it every single day. And I remember when I finally found the Wyoming license plate, which is the plate I couldn't find. I went nuts. I was so excited. My mom, we all celebrated. And, and my buddy's wearing a Wyoming shirt. Mike's got a Wyoming shirt on here too. So, so the good irony of that, that's amazing. But, 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 um, but then, you know, I remember I was very, I was a very happy child. Um, I had, I was pretty personable with kids. I, I got along, I was the middle child. I, I knew how to get along with people because I had to deal with my older brother and deal with my little sister. And uh, then once I hit seventh grade, things started to take a real sort of dark turn, if you will. Um, I'll never forget, I was in California on a family vacation. And I, and I grew up in a pretty, pretty religious family where I went to church and, you know, there were consequences if you didn't go to church in my own head, at least. And, and you know, I was just very nervous. I, I was very nervous about doing the wrong thing because I always wanted to be a good person. Always felt like I had to be morally right. And, and that really hurt me at, a, at an early age. And I remember we we're in, in California and I'm saying my nightly prayers. And this one specific night, I couldn't stop saying my prayers because I kept thinking, I kept having an intrusive thought about the devil during my prayers. And when I had these, this thought, I was like, oh my gosh, if I have a bad thought about the devil, that means my mom and my sister are going to get hurt or be possessed by the devil. And then it's going to be my fault. So I was like, all right, start over then. Start over. And again, another intrusive, and it would just go on and on and on. And it would usually take me about, you know, that night it took me about two to three hours just to get to sleep. And then I woke up and, you know, the thoughts didn't really go away. They kind of just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I remember as I, in seventh grade, I was a really good student in sixth grade, a really good student in fifth grade, but seventh grade was an awful year for me because I kept thinking that if I did this, something bad was going to happen to my friend. And I had this terrible OCD about being a bad person and about the devil. Those are my two big things that really crushed me. And I remember when I was drinking my water before I went to bed, I couldn't hit the number six because the six is the quote unquote devil's number. And if I did that, then I'd have to start all over again. And if I didn't feel right, I'd have to, you know, I just, that, that feeling of not feeling right and, and not, and no one knew about this. You know, my mom didn't know what was going on. I was just like, what the heck is going on? And um, I remember being in the hallways and I, you know, I, I can look back and laugh at it now, but when I was there, it was so sad to see because you know, I, I'd go into my seventh grade class, I'd be super energetic, super hyped up, like every, I, I'd put on the biggest facade on the outside to act like I was okay. And, and then I remember going into class and I would have a, if I walked through the door and had a bad thought, I'd have to go out of the door and pretend I was yelling at a friend or pretend I left my pencil there. I'd be like, oh, like, oh, I just left my, are you sure? Oh yeah. And then we'd walk right back into my seat and just, oh my gosh, like, hopefully this feels better. Hopefully I feel better today. Um, and it got to the point where I was really acting up in class. My parents started to no notice me touching my nose a bunch of times because that was a, another big thing for me. I, I was a baseball player growing up, and I loved the game of baseball. But this really hampered my ability to play, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I remember I used to have to touch my nose and, like, until I didn't even have a number, until it felt right. Because if I didn't touch my nose before, until it felt right, I'd get hit in the eye with the ball. or so, And it was too, super irrational. I never got hit in the eye in the ball. Hit in the eye with the ball my entire life. But I, if I didn't do this, that would happen or my teammate would get hit. And again, all would come down to being my fault. Uh, and then finally, you know, my parents really started noticing me acting up. They started noticing the little things I were doing and they had no idea what it was, obviously, because this is, you know, 16, 17 years ago now, and they didn't have any experience with OCD. And I went and I got diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. Did you really? That was actually kind of lucky that I, you got I diagnosed. Know. I did get very, very lucky because they, I had ADHD. They knew that. 
that was my first diagnosis. And, mm-hmm. and, and that was about a year before, but it wasn't, it was more, okay. You know, he just lacks a little focus. You know, they, they didn't think anything of it. And cause the OCD, ADD, ADHD wasn't really hampering my life. Mm-hmm. The OCD was controlling me. It was yeah. really controlling everything I did, every thought I had, every move that I made. Um, you know, I couldn't really sleep that well because these thoughts wouldn't stop. And I couldn't explain why these thoughts were happening. And my mom was finally seeing them in action because I had to, she used to sing me this bedtime story every night. And I remember I'd have to say something in the middle of the bedtime story. And if I didn't say it a certain amount of times, you know, something bad would happen. And, and, you know, she was just trying to be really nice and calm and be like, Hey, you know, what's going on? And I remember my dad was just like, what is going on here? Like, this is, this is not quote unquote, not to say normal, but you know, in my head, they, no one knew what was going on because my brother didn't have any experience with it. My little sister didn't have any experience with it. I was just kind of this middle child with these uh, intrusive thoughts. Um, yeah. And it's funny how like you were suffering. Well, it's not really funny, but you were suffering no, for so long <laughs> yeah, <it> was. <laughs> before mm-hmm. they noticed. And I think that happens a lot where like once it's on the parents radar where you're kind of like, what is going on with him? You've already been suffering for quite a while. I know. And, and it was because you always try to hide it because you don't want to show your quote unquote, weakness to your parents. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember when I got diagnosed, it was very interesting. I got amazing support from my family and I got incredible support from my buddy, John Kelly, who also happened to have OCD. And we were at a family party um, shortly after I got diagnosed. And I was still very confused at the time because I just started seeing this new therapist um, who happened to be a, a, an amazing guy. He ended up really doing a lot of work for me because he had OCD too um, growing up, which, and you know, obviously it doesn't go away, but he, he knows how to deal with it. Yeah. And it helped, it helped me big time. And John, I remember comes up to me, he goes, John, like, uh, I hear you have OCD. And I was like, how'd you know? Like, who told you this? Like, why do you know this? He's like, dude, our parents talk. And I was like, well, why, why did my mom tell you this? <laughs> and he, and he goes, he goes, John, like, it's okay. Like I have OCD too. And I was like, I was floored because I was like, you have these thoughts about the devil possessing your mom and all. I, I was almost scared to say it. And he was yeah. like, dude, all the time. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And, and from that moment on, I had someone to fight it with me, which helped so much in my own recovery because I had him, I had my therapist and I had my family. I didn't tell many of my other friends because I was still a little bit afraid and I still very much stigmatized myself and I still quote unquote, unfortunately, and I'm embarrassed to say this because I, I would never tell anyone who's going through this now but I thought I was, you know, I was embarrassed of, of what was going through my head, even though there was so much beauty uh, in me and there was so much potential. I just, I was embarrassed instead of thinking of the good things that, that I could do. But Well, and I think um, most, most kids are in that, in that boat, you know, yeah. so I don't think you should be embarrassed to say that. I think it's good for other people to hear because yeah. it's just, that's why we have to normalize it so that there is no embarrassment. So exactly. how, how old were you? Was John your best friend like growing up or how old were you when that happened? So this is a great story. So John was my brother, Paul's best friend. We grew up in a really small town. So our town had about a hundred kids in each grade. Uh, Dobbs, Surrey, New York, give a little shout out to it. <laughs> I, I love it. And I have, I wear the shirt in every interview because it says in this town, <laughs> legends never die. And, uh, yeah. I, oh, there it is. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. My good luck shirt. And, um, um, so, so John always, when I was a kid before the OCD, he always let me join in all the fun. He would be, if my brothers were having a WrestleMania party with his friends, my brother would push me away being the typical older brother he was. And John would grab me right in and, um, and let me join in all the fun. So we always had a special connection with each other. Um, and our, fa- our parents were best friends too. And then after the OCD, we just had this pretty inseparable bond because, um, you know, I could tell him anything. And he loved hearing because I think it really helped him. Um, feel better about himself, which, you know, he deserved. He was an unbelievable guy. Yeah. And that, that was just really fortunate too, that you found someone else who had OCD. Extremely fortunate. And that's why I have so much compassion for anyone out there suffering because a lot of the kids out there do think they are alone, but they're not, you know, I was in the same boat as you where there's so many kids that are in the same boat as you and, and you really can do this and don't be embarrassed about these thoughts. Um, and I, and I remember I was talking to you about this. My, my original therapist used to always say, separate your OCD from yourself. Like your mind's going to try to trick you. You're a bad person. It's going to try to play all the mean tricks that it possibly can, but that's because deep down you're an incredible person and, and you're very sensitive and, and you have so much to give to the world, but you know, the OCD will always try to put tricks on you. And I've always tried to separate my OCD from myself when I get in my own little funks. Yeah. And um, we were talking earlier for those that are listening in the podcast um, that 
we're going to record a YouTube video. So when this goes and you are, if you're listening to this now, it's already up on YouTube that, you know, John is going to be, um, gracious enough to record like a, a video for your kids directly, because I think it's good to hear. Um, cause right now we're just talking to parents, but I think it'll be really good for kids to hear directly. Um, some of the stuff that you're saying and help them. So check out YouTube. I'll leave a link below because I think that's going to be really helpful too. I can. That's awesome. Thank you. So I want to go into a little bit about um, how parents can help. And then I want to go into your story about your friend, John Kelly, because um, that's kind of the impetus of what got you going with JCK foundation. So we're going to go into that, but, but I want to first tap into what parents can do especially with moral OCD. So you're talking a lot about moral OCD. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when I, when I try to help parents with their kids with moral OCD, they're the child's compulsion. And it doesn't sound like you necessarily had this. I don't know, but like a big initial compulsion is to check with your parent. And so you might say, you know, uh, I heard some gossiping yesterday and I, I was standing there. Do you think I'm a bad person? Because I, was I participating in that? Or mom, you know, I took a piece of gum out of your purse uh, a year ago, and now I'm thinking that maybe I stole that from you. It, was that okay? So they get a lot of, um, and it gets far worse. You know, really, you know, I think you're fat, or I think I hate you. I think I don't love you, all that kind of stuff. And so the first step is, you know, obviously teaching kids about what moral OCD is, teaching the parent what it is. But then I teach the parent to not complete the OCD loop. And so I tell them, you know, to tell the child, you know, that's Mr. Bossy, or if they're older, you know, that's your OCD, or that's O, I don't talk to O, or tell O to leave you alone. And a lot of times I get some pushback from the parents, because they say, well, now my child's suffering, and they can't get relief from me. And now it's just in their head. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be so cool to hear your view on things on how to help. Well, that's a great point because I had all those thoughts. I had all that, that you brought back actually so many memories because Sorry. So, no, 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 not in a bad way. It, it, it brought back so many of those memories of, I would always have to ask my mom if what I was doing was okay. And I remember it got older. I remember even when my friends were like started to, you know, you know, in high school when they were say, quote unquote, having a beer or whatnot, I would always be like, if I'm like, if my friends are having a beer, but I'm not, am I a bad person? Like, and I would just say, I would always ask my parents, my mom especially, for permission because I was very comfortable talking to her about it. And the best thing that she always did because she was very close with my therapist and so was my father. Oh, and, cool. and they always provided me what I would call quote unquote tough love, but compassionate tough love. You know, knowing that that I was suffering was something that they hated. They didn't want to see me suffer, but they also knew that they couldn't feed into it. Right. So when I was having these thoughts, like when I was asking if I was a bad person, if I was asking, you know, am I possessed by the devil? Mom is like the devil possessing you. I remember it took me so long to even say those words to her because I was terrified that 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 was going to be the kicker and I was going to wake up and she would be gone. Yeah. You know, every kid's obviously the biggest nightmare. And um, and, and I remember when I would tell her these things, she would sit there and she would tell me, John, that's that's your OCD. You know, I'm not going to let you think like that. Uh, you know, you're not a bad person. I love you. She'd always say that. Always tell me that she loved me. Always tell me that I'm not a bad person, but she wouldn't let me go in the loop and she wouldn't allow me to go in the loop. And I would keep talking to like, John and then eventually I'm going to walk away uh, and she would eventually walk away. And then I would be able to kind of sit with these thoughts and tell my therapist how I was feeling and then kind of come back and say, okay, well, actually my mom isn't possessed by the devil. I'm not a bad person okay, let's be rational here. Like things are okay. And then of course it would still come back, but it built, it built so much resilience as a kid because I was quote unquote doing it on my own with my parents and with my therapist. But the point was, is I think every parent out there should understand that your kid isn't going to get mad at you if uh, it might be temporary, right? Your kid might get mad at you, might yell at you if you're giving them that tough love. It goes such a long way and it helps you, helps the kid, the child build that resilience to understand that their OCD A doesn't control them. And B, you're controlling it right there. And when you're controlling your OCD, that's the most powerful feeling as a child. Uh, and that's the most beautiful thing. And, and, and I think the best advice for a parent that, that I would give is to be compassionate, but be tough. Don't be too easy on, uh, on your child. Because if you're, if you're giving in and you're saying, oh, you know, let's talk about this, let's talk forever and let's let, get the loop going, you know, you're not going to get much done. Um, you want to have, you want to try to challenge your kid in a, in a healthy, in a healthy way where it's not obviously too overwhelming for the child. Yeah. And I think that's good advice because I think it's, it's counterintuitive to not, 
talk to your child when, when it seems like they're opening up and it seems like they want to talk about their problems. I always tell parents, you're not really talking to them at that time. You're talking to their OCD. Exactly. So, you know, you don't need to talk to their OCD, you know, you want to talk to them. And so building up that OCD muscle to build that resistance is, it's good for parents to hear that from you because you, you did um, really learn how to manage your OCD. So it's, it's a good example. Now, the other thing that I get, I'm just going to use you to myth bust all my, <laughs> all, Absolutely. The, all the things I hear in my practice and online. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I hear is if I don't let him talk about his OCD, like ad nauseum, mm -hmm. then he's not going to ever want to come to me for anything else. No, I, I, I'm with you on that one because the way I look at that, right, is if you're just only talking about your OCD, you're building your identity completely on your OCD. And, and I think, again, the biggest thing that helped me with that is, yes, there's a time and a place to talk about your OCD and they're going to come to you. And yes, you should be open with your child when they're, when they're talking to you and, and when they are kind of putting their heart on the line. But if you're doing it every day, every minute, and it's constant, that becomes a ritual for them. That becomes a ritual for the child to say, okay, the OCD is my life right now. And you never want that. And, you know, when you're fighting OCD and when you're trying to manage OCD, I always try to tell kids and I always try to tell myself, it's okay, I'm more than my OCD. Let's talk about something else. Let's go out there and, and maybe take your child to a baseball game, take your child to the park, like see what they could enjoy the day. And obviously sometimes, you know, the child will be talking more and more about the OCD, but how about let's challenge ourselves not to think about, well, not to say not to think about the OCD. That's, that's a tough challenge, but let's challenge ourselves to, to, to go to a ball game and let's challenge ourselves to find some other passions and other things to talk about outside of our OCD. Because I do think it is very dangerous when you're constantly talking about it because then, you know, you are identifying yourself with OCD, not with John, not with who I am, not with my hobbies, not with our parent-child uh, relationship, but rather our OCD and parent relationship, you know? Um, and, and, I, and I think that was the best thing that, again, my mother and my father did really well with me is, you know, they would, you know, they would understand a lot. The OCD caused me to get in a lot of trouble because, you know, I was silly. I would act up or do anything my friends told me because, you know, I was just trying to get a release. But, you know, we would talk about so many other things. And then when the OCD did act up, I felt comfortable telling them, guys, I'm having like a really, really tough day today. Here's how I'm feeling. And my mom would be okay. You know, it's just the OCD. You're going to see your therapist soon. You're going to get through this. And, but, you know, let's, you know, let's go outside. Let's go take a walk. And I, my mom actually would really help me, believe it or not. We got a dog and I was able to, you know, I was kind of like a therapy dog without even realizing it. Um, so I think just kind of back to the original question though is, um, it's always important to talk to your kids, but try to keep the OCD conversation controlled in a sense. Yeah. Because if, you, if you talk too much, it just becomes a little counterintuitive and you don't want them to build their identity off it, even though, you know, it's tough. I understand that, but, um, it, that really helped for me just talking about other things and taking walks and doing different things to try to challenge myself to, to, to build out the person, John, not John, the OCD sufferer. Yeah. I like that. Cause you're bringing up a couple of good points. Cause well, one, when you're doing a compulsion and it involves a parent, you're not even talking, like you're just compulsing, like it's 100%. not even that. But then too, and I, you know, you're talking about this and it's reminding me of my son, you know, it's so hard to see past his OCD. Uh, my son is nine and he has OCD and um, because probably also I'm an OCD therapist, like I just want to like conquer it and I want to empower him. And you're right. It's important also. So another really good point you made to see beyond the OCD you know, instead of me seeing him whenever he's eating and seeing an OCD challenge in front of me, you know, because his is around food a lot of times, <laughs> like why not just see him as a kid and really foster other things that um, can spark creativity? I mean, kids with OCD tend to be the most creative kids on the planet. Um, he and I just got him this whole program called uh, Kid Entrepreneur or Kid oh, Kidpreneur, yeah. you know, <laughs> so it's like it's this online course for kids. And so I bought him the book and I got him the online course and I'm telling him he can make his own business, you know. And so I think redirecting a lot of that that energy into something positive, it's not distraction, but it's like if I have something good going on, then I'm going to, you know, I can see one as a parent, I can see my kid is doing something awesome and mm -hmm. tap into their strengths. But two, I think for the child, if you're passionate about something else, it competes with OCD because you got something to think about. That's an incredible point because the next step for me was I found those passions. I started broadcasting basketball and football games when I got into middle and high school. Well, early high school is when I started doing it. 
And that helped me forget so much about my OCD and it helped me just curate my passion. I want to make sure I get these stats right rather than I want to make sure that I don't touch my nose 15 times to the devil's obsessing my mom, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and like you said, like you see him as a child and you see him as curating those passions. And a lot of kids with OCD are the most compassionate and, and like you said, the most creative kids out there because they, they're having two conversations at once all the time. They're talking yeah. to their head and they're talking to you and they're talking to the world, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, and I love that, that point that you make, because when you are able to curate passion, it, it, it also, you know, curates empowerment within the child. Um, and to know that there are other things outside the OCD and it gives them less of an excuse to sit inside and blame their OCD for what's going on. Yeah. Um, because when you're able to go out there and do it, yeah, you're going to have those tough days. But when you start blaming your OCD for everything, you're just taking, you know, you're, I, I don't want to say it's making an excuse, but as a child, I, I learned very early try to try to not blame my OCD, but rather understand that this is a part of what I have to deal with. And, and you know, it's going to come up sometimes harder than others, but let's curate other things that help calm my OCD down. Broadcast basketball games, play a sport, do art, you know, take a walk, get a, you know, enjoy dogs, you know, just like curating those healthy passions um, that, 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 that kind of set up those lifelong good habits, if you will. Yeah, that, that's a huge component that I think a lot of us miss. So that's mm -hmm. a good point. So I want to switch gears. Let's go, into, let's go into your story with John Kelly. This kind of was um, the impetus for all the great work that you've been doing. Yeah. And John, so John was the best person I've ever met. He, as I was saying earlier, he was an OCD sufferer, and he took me under his wing and told me that I could be okay. And um, as, as I got older and older, unfortunately, John's OCD and depression, he, he was a dual sufferer, um, got a lot worse. And he was growing up in a time where, you know, he didn't have someone really to look up to. People weren't really talking about uh, OCD. And he, you know, in his college essay, he actually wrote a beautiful story about how he wanted to change the way the world viewed mental health, especially OCD. And this is in 2004. Wow. Um, and, 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 you know, he was the type of guy that would do anything to help someone else because he was so compassionate. He was so creative. He went to Colgate, just such a smart guy that everyone loved. Um, and unfortunately when he was 24, he, he passed away. He, he succumbed to his OCD and depression. And you know, when that happened, I was actually going through a tough time, my own OCD. Um, and after it, obviously it kind of really hit me hard and um, you know, it was really tough, but at the same time, the best thing that happened out of that was I went back to therapy and I understood that, you know, I, I could be okay. And I'm still going to be okay. Because, you know, I wasn't taking care of my OCD for three years, if you think about it. Um, but, but John taught me the power, really, of, of resilience and the power of community. Because, you know, after everything happened, not only, you know, was I devastated, but our whole town was, was shook and really sad. Because, again, why would such an incredible human do this? Um, because again, no one really understood what was going on in his head at the time. And I had a little bit of an understanding because I was a sufferer myself and I'd been through a similar crisis, but not as severe as what John was going through. Um, and you know, we always, I ended up making a documentary about his life and we had the first ever JCK legend softball tournament just, um, uh, about literally three months after he passed away, because again, we didn't want this, this hurt to take over. We didn't want this fear of, of mental illness, quote unquote, to take over. We wanted to fight for people and understand that, hey, John would do anything for anyone. Now let's do anything for John. And let's make sure we get out there, we build a community, and we show anyone else out there that there is a community for them, that they are alone. They don't have to be ashamed of what's going on in their head and to never, ever give up. And to set that example of hope, to set that example of positivity, and to give people an outlet to share their stories and to build upon themselves and to build that resilience. Um, so that first tournament was beautiful. And, you know, we all wore all little league jerseys and we all came together. Everyone flew in and, you know, it was 2011. And, and I remember at the end of that day, my team won and I belly flopped into the pool and I screamed up. I looked at John. I was like, that was for you, my man. And, yeah. um, and it, was, it was just incredible because, you know, um, we didn't want to see what happened to John happen to anyone else. And we didn't want that to be an example for anyone else of what to do when, you know, things go wrong. There are so many other valuable resources, people. And then we wanted to build, we really wanted to build that community factor because social isolation is always, I think, the, you know, the number one factor to a mental illness, in my opinion. And it's really hard because if you feel isolated and you feel like you don't have anyone and you feel like you don't have anyone that has your back, it's tough. And we wanted to say, hey, John had my back. 
and John had our friends back and we're going to do anything in our power to have your back. And we want to give you that community of love, the community of hope, the community of resilience and do anything in our power to, to show you that, Hey, you could live a happy, help, helpful and hopeful life. Even if you're going through OCD, depression, anxiety, whatever it may be. Um, it, it was a, mu a beautiful thing. And, and then the documentary kind of sparked into the foundation and people just started sharing their stories with me. And it was unbelievable how many people have a story and that resilience that we all built together. Because when you heal with the community behind you, oh my gosh, you feel so empowered. And, and you know, whenever I go through something, I know I have this whole community that has my back. And I want everyone suffering, anyone out there listening, any parent out there, wh whoever out there is listening, you know, you do have a community and you, and you know, you do have an ability to recover and, and every day, you know, can get better. Yeah. And I think it's so beautiful how you took this tragedy and you, you, you know, his, his, um, his words live on, you know, and his message lives on and you've really kind of fostered what he wanted to do in this world. And I do, I agree with you. I think that social isolation is probably the worst part about mental illness. And yeah. And that's what, and especially with OCD, because it's just something that no one wants to talk about. Even now um, at this stage, it's crazy. And there's more communities to tap into, but I think people don't realize. So I do want to say the documentary is incredibly beautiful <laughs> and well-made. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I watched it twice and a long time ago when I get introduced, I got introduced to you because yeah. uh, I was so moved by it. So people should definitely check out the, the documentary. Yeah, I, th I think it gives people a good idea of what actually goes on in the head of someone who's suffering. And that, again, the most important thing is how we all rally together and how we can have someone else's back and how we're going to do everything in our power to, to make sure that, that you're comfortable with yourself and that you build that resilience and that you're able to kind of foster your own passions. And I, it, just, it just means a lot. It does. So then, so then the JCK Foundation was created. Yeah. And then can you talk a little bit about what the foundation does? Cause it Absolutely. seems like it's growing. When I went on your website recently, I was like, Oh my gosh, you're like in Uganda. <laughs> 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 what is going on here? So, so the foundation is uh, obviously something that's really special to us. And it all started after that first softball tournament. And we said, okay, you know, we were young. I was 21 at the time. Uh, now I'm 29. And I remember I was 21 and, and all of our friends, we wanted to do something to honor John. And it was, I think the most beautiful part about it was, John's father, we're all really close with. He's unbelievable. And John's mother, but his parents are incredible. And, you know, they let us run with this foundation because we wanted to do it for other kids and to show that, hey, friends could come together. And this is how we really build things. It doesn't just have to be your parents or your therapist. Like, let's set an example for people of what a community can really be. And let's give a person that hope that, hey, we're going to grab you and, and bring you in and do whatever we can to show you that there is a community. And it really all started um, in 2013. I actually showed the documentary and started speaking at schools. Uh, I was working at ESPN at the time. And I, I was, you know, I liked my job, but I, the amount of listening and, and the things that I would hear at the end after I shared my story and hearing what other kids were saying was the most beautiful thing because they were opening up for the first time sometimes and understanding that they aren't alone and that they have people to talk to and that they're, they can recover and that this is a beautiful thing. Like we're in this together and, and we would smile and we would walk away and some of the conversations were amazing. Some were sad because people were still struggling, but it always led to people saying, okay, let's keep fighting. Let's keep pushing. We're not just doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for everyone else because your story matters more than you can even imagine. And when you push forward, you inspire another person to keep going. And so eventually in, um, so in 2014, we were doing the speaking, we did the tournament. Uh, and now in, I, in 2018, we were switching to, to actual programming at high schools and uh, at colleges. And we also have our, our community events, which is the Kelly's Heroes events, where we bring John's values of companionship and acceptance to the forefront. And people run 5Ks. We have a Legends Tournament. We just bring mental illness and mental health really in a positive light um, to say, okay, you know, I know that they're suffering, but let's all be there together and show that let's smile. Let's, let's fight for people who, who can't smile right now. And let's show them that they will have the ability to smile again one day. Um, so we have the community events, but the school programming is our, our biggest push. You know, we really want to enhance, uh, these communities and do anything that we can do, um, to really build, uh, a community of love, support, and, and most importantly, um, resilience. Um, and, and that's what the main focus of the programs really are is to be able to get into these schools and to really capture, capture the kids and let them understand 
that, okay, you know, whether you're a sufferer or non-sufferer, and this is not even with OCD anymore, this is all sorts of, of mental, health, uh, mental health disorders, because there's obviously there's so much and they all really do interact, but we always try to present mental health as kind of a social justice movement in a sense that's for five and five. It's for everyone. And if mm-hmm. we get all the kids on the same page in a classroom early on to say, hey, like, I have power to help someone. I have power to help myself. I have resources like Natasha. I have resources like, like, like my school, you know, my, my school counselor. And I also have resources like my friends, like the JCK yeah. community. Um, and then we tell them um, the story of, of myself and of John. And we, and we sit there and we have breakout groups at the end of, of uh, the presentations to really dissect what these kids are going through. Because, you know, the more we can take in from them, the more we could build forward. Because you're not going to change a community in one day, but you can sure start. You could short provide hope in that one day. And then as you go on and on, ideally um, we'll be there for more than a day. Our goal is to get on campus for a week and eventually provide a, a, full, a full layer of support that enhances um, you know, what the schools are already doing. But it's a really special way to say, hey, this is for everyone. Um, you know, we're not doctors, but we're people that just care, just like you. And, and, and we want you to be uh, happy with who you are and to be um, compassionate to yourself and compassionate towards others. So the programming is such a blast. And um, we do that. We have a podcast, Collected Layers, where we try to share as many stories as we can, um, you know, again, to, to show people that, hey, there's so many ways to connect without you realizing it. And the main key is, hey, connection. Um, yeah. You know, connection is the biggest part of what we do. And it's not always the easiest thing to show, tell an administrator, right? you know, connection is the key, but it really, really is. Um, because kids connect in different ways and we want to provide them a way to just understand that, you know, they have the power within themselves, they have a purpose and their story matters more than they can imagine. And think about how many lives are being changed every time you talk to high school students or every time you talk to a college where somebody in that audience is hearing for the first time that there's a name for what they're going through. I mean, that has got to happen in every talk that you do. And that's just that's just mind blowing how you can make that much of a difference because I feel like going directly to the kids, to the teenagers, yeah. to colleges, those are the people that have got lost. And unfortunately I think that's majority of people. Mm-hmm. And so educating them that they're not alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just so powerful. Exactly. And understand that they have the ability to live a better life. You know, recovery isn't linear. Don't beat yourself up for feeling bad today. You yeah. know, when I was 19, I, I wasn't in the best place, but I'm 29 and I'm happy and I still go through things. But yeah. listen, you know, it, it, you have a whole life ahead of you, so to speak. And sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the compulsion of the day, you know, of what's, of what, of what's hurting today. But, you know, what's going through your head today isn't going to be going through your head tomorrow. Might not be going through your head in a week, maybe a month, maybe a year. But it gives kids the opportunity to understand that they can live a really beautiful life. And when you bring a community together and you have people who quote unquote suffer and keep people who don't suffer on the same page working together, uh, I just think that goes such a long way because the conversations are more open. Um, and also people are enjoying life more because they're not really hiding these things. Um, and they're able to get out there and enjoy what's going on in front of them rather than, you know, be stuck in their heads. And we don't want anyone to be stuck in their head. Um, that was the one thing John always taught me. He helped me get things out. And, you know, when you're going through those tough times, it's not always easy, but he never wanted me to be stuck in my head. And I don't want anyone out there to be stuck in their head. Yeah. And they don't have to be. And, and I think, you know, I was just thinking about this, like what a great time to interview you because it's (laughs) May and it's mental health awareness month. And this is a perfect, this is a perfect month to interview you because we can all do our part. And I don't mean that in a preachy sort of way, but I know for me, you know, mental health is mental health, mental illness is rampant in my family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up with a a severely mentally ill father, you know, and that's probably why I do what I do, you know, and then I birthed three kids with mental health issues, you know, because that's just so genetic. But, you know, you take all that and then you do something good with it, you know, so, Mm -hmm. you know, I do this kind of stuff to help disseminate information and support parents you know, you took a loss, you know, really serious loss, and you're making something beautiful out of it. We can all do our part. It doesn't even have to be a big part. But Mm -hmm. even if you work at a school, or if you work at a college, or if you are in touch with administrators, or if you are an administrator, you know, just bringing your foundation in and educating the students will have a ripple effect for years and decades to come. So, So could people just anywhere, you know, in the country contact you if they have. Absolutely. 
Yes, they, they can reach out to me. So right now we're focusing on, we're focusing on our one day program um, because our goals for that one day, and we only have two full-time employees right now because we, we really hit the ground. We go for it. Yeah. But we, we have the one day program that we love. Uh, and we're going to try to use that one day to get on campuses, to show them how we work, to show them how we actually talk to the students, the administrators, and really bring the whole community together to get on that same page to really enhance wellness in these schools. Um, Cause obviously a lot of these schools are already doing good work and we just want to be an enhancer to make you guys even more comfortable with what's going on. Um, and then, you know, after the one day, we're trying to push for those one week programs. So anywhere, anywhere in the country, you could reach out and we would be honored to talk to you about coming to your school because it's, it's what I live for. I, I, I love it so much and there's nothing more powerful than, than connecting with the student and talking to that, that student and hearing their story and hearing them feel better about themselves, that they don't have to think of their mental illness as a crutch. But hey, you know, it's something I have to live with, I could deal with, but I'm gonna be happy. I'm gonna live a normal life and you can live a normal life. And that's such a, something that I think gets lost sometimes just because you are suffering doesn't mean you can't live this amazing and happy life. And you set that example for other people, that chain effect really starts to spark bigger and bigger change. And all of a sudden you're living in a world with a lot, hopefully a lot more confident and happy people. Yeah, this is where change starts. I think, you know, it's, this is grassroots stuff where you start with the kids and people around kids. So uh, people can find you at jckfoundation.org. Yes. yes. So I'll give you guys a few places to find me. Um, jckfoundation.org. Um, that's our, that's our website. And I, and I know you said you would have the link to the documentary that, that you could kind of sh share around. And also, if you want to contact me directly, I would love to talk to you, especially if you want to just talk about anything going on with, with you or your, or your child, or if you want to bring us to your school, just email me. And my email is john at jckfoundation.org. Uh-oh. <laughs> you're you're going to get a lot of emails. <laughs> Be prepared. Uh, I'll be ready. The beautiful thing is, is now that schools are almost are, are, are out of session, we're really rebuilt. We're really building up the fall pipeline of programs. So the more emails, the merrier. And I, and I hope, and I mean, hey, I, I asked for it. So I'm excited. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that we can all do our part, whether it's yeah. small or, or huge, like what you're doing. Um, so yeah, if you have connections at a school or if you are active at a school, high school or college, definitely reach out to John. Um, can, if people don't have those connections or don't have that, is there a way to donate to your foundation just to financially support you? Yes, that, that would be awesome as well. Or if you want to just reach out and contact us, whatever works for you. And, and if you just go to the foundation's website and you go to jckfoundation.org, uh, the donate button should right be on the top, right? I think you could just do slash donate as well. Um, and obviously that goes a long way because we're trying to build out these programs. We're trying to build more and more, uh, a bigger team so we can go to more and more schools. And, you know, we're actually bringing on, uh, therapists as a part of our program too, to, to be there in the schools with the, with the kids. Um, so they give that professional experience too, because we have that great passion and we have the great knowledge of our own stories and of working with the administration, but Hey, it, you know, the more, again, the more you work together and the more people you bring into these programs, the more impact it will have. And ideally it sets an example for, for hope at these communities and, and, and it gives kids an opportunity to, to just show the world how special they really are. Yeah, I think that's awesome. So um, I would definitely recommend watching the documentary, going on your website. Um, and I know you weren't looking for donations, but I would highly, <laughs> I would encourage it because I feel like you're at the beginning of something that's gonna grow really, really big. So oh, thank, thank you, you for all thank your work. You. Thank That's you. You're awesome. making me blush over here. Ah. <laughs> Nobody can be on the podcast. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you guys are, this is a, a great day. And um, again, I just can't thank you enough for having me here and keep fighting the good fight. We're all here for you. And Tosh is doing absolutely incredible things. And there's so many people doing good work. And the more we all get on the same page, the more hope we provide for, for everyone. So this is, this is a great day. Yeah. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thank you. When I first discovered Natasha, I was in a desperate place with my son and his anxiety was getting worse and we had tried counseling and it was not going well. We were told at that point, you know, we can't help your son, early intervention is great, he's too young. Parenting a child with anxiety is not easy and sometimes it feels hopeless. First time we took her to a therapist who then dismissed her after about a year and a half. 
putting it down to bad parenting. But what if it didn't have to be that way? What if you could join a community with parents in the same boat, with kids with similar struggles and issues? What if you could have access to resources that will help you with behavior and sleep and avoidance and opposition and fears? What if you can have somebody walk with you on your journey? Someone with clinical expertise and parental knowledge. Hi, my name is Natasha Daniels and I'm a child therapist and a mom to three kids. And I've dedicated my life and my career to helping kids with anxiety and OCD, including my own. And now I wanna help you too. I have created the AT Parenting Community to do just that. When you join as a member of the community, not only will you get access to resources that will help you with your child's struggles and help your family reduce the chaos in their home, you're going to be joining a community of parents just like you with knowledge, love, and support to give. You will get access to online classes that will help your child and your child's struggles. You'll also get bonus videos and podcast material made just for members. And I've got your kids covered too. You'll have access to a library full of worksheets and videos specially designed for your kids by myself and other therapists. But that's not the best part. You're gonna be getting direct attention from me and I will be giving you support in many different ways. I'll be doing Facebook Lives every single week in our private Facebook group where members can go to talk and get support. I'll also be doing office hours in our private Facebook group. So once a week, you can ask me whatever you want. I'll be available for an hour to answer your direct questions. But if you need a little bit more support, I've got you covered too, because I will be doing coaching calls for those that need it twice a month. And for those that need even more support, I'll be doing once a month support group calls. And I'll be doing a member spotlight call. So I'll be picking one member every month and I'll be walking them through the process of helping their children. And you'll have access to the replay and to that phone call as well. Raising a child with anxiety or OCD is hard but together we can get through it. Natasha gave us practical tools. She wasn't like the books that we had read. If you have a child with anxiety or OCD, she is your go-to woman. Um, Natasha had practical real life advice that we started implementing the day that we listened to them. In a desperate time, in my journey with my son, she has been a lifesaver. Her resources have given me hope, they've given me tools and support, and they're some of the best resources you can find out there for anxiety and OCD.